My name is James Gerber. I'm the director of the Undergraduate International Business Program and a professor of economics at San Diego State University. Uh, I want to thank Ibero for the opportunity to uh, be here today and to speak to an uh, audience on the border about the border, something that has occupied my attention and a lot of my research and interest for a number of years. Uh, what I would like to do first is, is contextualize a bit the economy of the border. And then I have three things, that I, that are three points that I want to make, which I think are not part of the discourse about the border, but should be part of that discourse. So let me first start by contextualizing a little bit the three points that I want to make. The context I want to draw is, this, is these two extremes that we hear about San Diego, Tijuana, US-Mexico border region. One extreme, nationalism. The other extreme, globalism. So we have people in, in both those positions, the extreme nationalists, the extreme globalists. The nationalists operate out of a way of thinking that goes back to probably the 1950s or the 1960s, the Cold War, the nation state as the unit of analysis. There's Mexico, there's the United States, two sovereign nations, two separate independent entities, Yes, some interaction, but these are very different places with very different reasons for, for existence, with very different uh, ideas, cultures, societies, and so forth. Not a lot of overlap in the nationalist view. Not a lot of need for overlap uh, in, in that view. So I say to those people, if that's the way you think, then come to Fashion Valley and wander around a bit and listen, listen to the people that you hear there. Or better yet, come near where I live. Uh, on El Cajon Boulevard, there's a market, Pancho Villa's Farmer's Market, uh, where you can get mangoes and 15 different kinds of chiles. And you'll see that this, that this hard, fast line between the United States and Mexico isn't quite like you might think that it is. Now, most of you are here in, in, a, in, a, in a border audience in some sense, and per, you probably, not many of you think like that, is my guess. I mean, that's a, I do find that way of thinking quite a bit on, on the other side of the border uh, in the United States. But the nationalists have a point. There is a point to what they're saying. And if you think that there isn't, then do the following exercise, which is something I like to do. It tells me a lot about the border. Go to Fashion Valley. Go to Nordstrom's or Macy's. When you go to buy your whatever it is you're going to buy, you take out your wallet, innocent face, very straight, and you say, uh, do, do you take pesos? <laughs> right? And here's how this goes. Here's, here's what happens. They look at you and they think, oh, this person is joking or something. <laughs> so, you, so you keep a straight face, very innocent, and you say, oh, uh, oh, OK, you don't take pesos. I just asked because I was in Tijuana yesterday, and they take dollars. So I thought you might take pesos. <laughs> and then they're a little bit disgusted at, by that thought. You know, Actually, just parenthetically, let me say, I think this is a real opportunity for businesses in San Diego. I think it would be smart of them to take pesos for a variety of reasons that, that they would benefit if they did that. OK, so you, can, so you continue this. You continue this little dialogue, because it tells you a lot about how some people think about the border. right? And this should be a cautionary tale for, for globalists, for, for the people that think the world is flat, for people that think that there's really no difference. We're now one integrated area. You ask this person who's told you that they don't take pesos and they're getting a little bit impatient that you keep insisting. Uh, you know, and you say, well, yeah, OK. You don't, but you know, it's, I just thought maybe because we're so close to the border that you might take pesos. And sometimes you get the following response. We're not near the border. That's way far from here, you know, 15 miles. <laughs> 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 this tells you about how many people look at San Diego, Tijuana. It tells you a lot. It's a barometer, if you will, of some part of the population's, some part of the population's perspective. 
Okay, so we've got the nationalists, we've got the globalists. This is the context of the border. We're somewhere in between. We're somewhere in between. We're not, we're not 100% separate with solely national concerns, but nor are we a flat world in which there's no differences between San Diego and Tijuana, and everybody has the same opportunities and the same advantages on both sides of the border. That's not an accurate description either. Many people live in San Diego and never think about the border. And the idea to them is slightly absurd to think about it. That's just the reality that we face. OK, that's the context. Now, three points that I want to make about this that I think are not part of the national discourse, either in Mexico or in the United States, that should be part of our discourse. This first point is geographic. The second point is political. And the third point is social. OK, so geography. Economic integration between the United States and Mexico is a border phenomena. It's not a national phenomena. It's not happening uniformly, equally spread throughout the United States, uniformly, equally spread throughout Mexico. It's happening at the border. We know this for a variety of reasons. There are empirical measurements of this. We understand this completely. If, if you look, for example, at how we measure economic integration, one of the ways, trade flows. Mexico doesn't keep statistics on the origin, the state origin of its exports. Mexico measures exports, but you don't really know if they were produced in Sonora or Durango or, or what state. Ciudad de Mexico or, or wherever, you don't know. But the US has those statistics. And what we know is this. Over 60% of all US exports to Mexico originate in the four border states. Texas, California primarily, but also Arizona secondarily, and a tiny amount in New Mexico. Right? So our trade, at least as measured by US exports, is coming from border states. This is the origin of these goods. Not just that these goods pass through those states, but it's the origin of where those goods are produced and then sent to Mexico. So that's trade. Migration, right? Migration. Um, we know, you know one in 10 Mexicans, approximately, lives in the United States. Uh, they are spread out. But two thirds of them live in the four border states. They're still highly concentrated. Your compatriots are highly concentrated in California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. A border phenomena. Movement of people is one of the ways in which we understand this, this, the degree of integration between two nations. And that movement is a border phenomena. It's mirrored, we don't have good statistics, but it's mirrored by what I like to jokingly refer to as the anti-reconquista, which is all the Americans that are buying condos in Baja and elsewhere. And this is a mirror image of that. This is a, the, the same phenomenon is happening. There's a concentration of Americans who are not migrants, not tourists. They don't really fall into any social science category, uh, but they have property and they are locating an important part of their lives in the border region. Foreign direct investment is something else we look at when we talk about economic integration. And most US foreign investment in Mexico goes to Mexico City. It's a, it varies by year, but it's about half, sometimes as high as 60% Mexico City. Okay, most of it goes there. So if you take that, that 40 to 45% that's left, the vast majority of that goes to the border states, the six Mexican states on the border. So, this, so, my, so investment, foreign investment, is consistent with these other facts about, about integration. It's integration has a place. It's not a general national phenomenon. It has a place. The place is the border. This is a reason why we border residents should be quite concerned about it. It affects us far more than it affects the rest of Mexico or the rest of the United States. Okay. That's, the, that's the, the geography, okay? Let me talk a little bit about the politics. This integration that we're seeing 
is not the result of national agreements signed between the United States and Mexico. Right? It's not due to NAFTA. It's not due to these, to these pieces of paper which have the signatures of important people in the United States and Mexico on it. It's due to the activities and actions of everyday people living in the border region. Business people, students, families, citizens going about their daily lives in what seems to them a reasonable, normal way. That's what's creating this integration. If you, if you look at the growth of the maquiladora industry, for example, or the growth of trade between the United States and Mexico, there's no structural break. That is, there's no change in the trajectory and the pattern that happens after NAFTA. NAFTA didn't suddenly create this. It was going on before that, and it's continued to go on after that, in spite of a, a, a number of very serious difficulties that stand in the way. Jeffrey Davidow was a U.S. ambassador to Mexico from the United States under the, um, under the last two years of the Zedillo administration, which was the last two years of the Clinton administration, and the first two years of the Fox administration, which was the first two years of the Bush administration. He wrote a book about his experiences. Uh, the book is, is, is a fun read. It's called The Bear and the Porcupine. Um, you guys are the porcupine. We're the bear. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll leave it to you to unravel that, that <laughs> metaphor a little bit. But, but I, I decided one year I was going to use this book in a, in a class I teach. And so I'm going through it, and I'm looking at the chapters, and I'm trying to, okay, what's this chapter about? What's this chapter about? And I'm writing next to each chapter what the dominant theme of the chapter is. There's, I don't know, 15 chapters, something like that. And I get down and I look at my list. There's two subjects. That's it. Every chapter was on one of two things, drugs, migration. That's what the national governments are thinking about. This is the U.S. ambassador to Mexico. This is where he spent his time. These are the issues that he worked on. This reflects U.S. Uh, actions, thoughts, attitudes towards Mexico. What's important? What, is the, what does the national political scene have to deal with? What's its, fo what's its focus? Right? It's not all of this integration that's going on in the border region. It's not that, right? It's drugs and migration. Those are the two things, right? So this migration is, is really the result of, as I said before, it's the result of all kinds of, of uh, or this integration is the result of all kinds of actions by individuals, by organizations. We, you can name your own favorites, but you know, there are civil society organizations like VIA International or the International Community Foundation. There are universities that have uh, dual degree programs. The, the program I direct has dual degree programs with CETIS and UABC in Tijuana. So we have students two years here, two years there. They get degrees from both places. Uh, it's the result of churches which have uh, which have, uh, you know, a church will have a church in San Diego and a church in Tijuana is quite common. It's a result of families uh, which live on both sides of the border. All right? This is what's driving this integration. It's the result of, of small businesses. Right? You go, in, go, into any, uh, go into any restaurant in San Diego, and you'll, and you'll see what I mean. Poke your head in the kitchen and see who's working there. This is part of the, part of the integration. Okay, geography, politics, society. So what's, what, what's the, the social theme here? The social theme is this, that something new is happening in the border region. This is something new. There's a new type of citizenship that's being created in the border region, and it's due to the creation of this what I refer to as trans-border or transnational population. This is a new phenomenon. I, I have a friend that works at San Diego State. She grew up in Tijuana. She now lives in San Diego. And I say to her, Prisca, are you, she has double citizenship. I say, are you Mexican or are you US? What do you feel the most? And she says, yeah, she says, well, when I'm in Tijuana, I'm Mexican. When I'm in San Diego, I'm American. 
right? This, some people, it's not quite that equal. Some people, it's a little bit more one or the other, right? But this is a new form of, this is a new form of citizenship. People that are equally comfortable in Tijuana and in San Diego, going back and forth. They have, in many cases, dual citizenship. Their children will have dual citizenship. This is going to grow. This is a growing phenomenon, right? The point about this, the point of the whole talk, really, in some ways, is that, is that our future depends on these people. Our future as a prosperous region, as a, as a region that moves ahead and distinguishes itself in some way, depends on this, these people. We need these people to thrive, right? Some of them are not getting what they need, but we need to change that, right? There are people that don't speak Spanish or English very well. You know, they're in the technical term is uh, partial biliterates, right? These are people that are illiterate in two languages. Right? Uh, they need resources, right? That's one part of this group. There's another part of this group which is highly educated, highly accomplished, and moves back and forth. This is our new society. This is the future of the border region. And I think that we all should do what we can to support this and to make it grow from whatever perspective we're working and operating. Thank you. <laughs>